as we get ready to hear from God's Word. Father, you see these images and texts and different things that are posted on WeChat. Uh, We know that that rises to you as an offering, an act of worship that we trust that uh, brings a smile, or puts a smile on your face. And we know it does because that's what your word says. We bring you great pleasure, especially, Lord, as your people come together desiring to honor you, to worship you, and to use this time to uh, be given back to you. So we just thank you that we can study your word so freely. We can look into the word and see more of you and more of ourselves. And uh, we just ask that you continue to guide our time. And yeah, you be pleased, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. My name is Simon, and together with Matt and a few other of the design team members, it's been a joy to have a part to play in putting together Indigenous Hong Kong. Um, I have entitled my talk, the 4 a.m. talk, but that it's done at 10 a.m. <laughs> the reason why is because this message came to me at 4 a.m. one morning as I was preparing for Indigenous artists in Ethiopia, I was there visiting the site, and just, you know, you get jet lagged and woke up in the, in the early morning and God just deposited a, a very important message. Uh, I read through Ephesians a couple of times and I uh, thank, thank you, Matt, for leading us through the time. But when you have time and space to do that, when you read through Ephesians, you just be, you know, amazed at all that God has done for us. Yeah. So, I, whether inspired by the Spirit or inspired by jet lag, I'm convinced this is the message that God has for all of us. And so let me start off by saying, and you've probably heard the MC say it, and you've heard us say it in different ways, that this is more than a conference. This is really more than a conference. Um, I, uh, you'll be sure there'll be a meeting of minds, we will share hearts, we will connect in, you know, our spirits, we will join hands towards the task, and let me add that I'm really thrilled to see all of you guys, you know, making the, the, the intentional effort to be here. And in fact, you even learn, you laugh, you, you learn cool things, you hear cool things, and walk away with tangible action points. But I'm convinced as I uh, serve in the conference team and seen two conferences, uh, Indigenous conferences so far, that God has much more in store for you and I. And that's just the kind of God He is. And if you read a little further down in Ephesians 3, He is the God that always does what? Immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine. So that's why I feel that it's important, as Matt had said, we know we want to start our morning unplugged. Or as I like to say, we get plugged in to what God has in mind. So if you don't mind, let me just pray one more time that God would really grip our hearts, right? Lord, we do come humbly before You desiring to seek you with all our hearts. And so we lay the gifts, talents, skills, and even the toys at the feet of the cross. But most of all, we lay our lives before you, lives that you have redeemed, and we come uh, before you humbly. Lord, would you come and minister to each of our hearts? Lord, I know you have something special for each person here. Help us, you know, to listen to that as we consider the truths in your word. In your name we pray. Amen. If you would turn to Ephesians 2, 10, I know some tables probably looked at that earlier, but the rest of you may not have flipped to that page or that screen. So Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. And I want to an- anchor our, our thoughts on this verse this morning. Okay. The New Living Translation puts it, you know, beautifully. We are God's, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good works which Christ, uh, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. And I'll read uh, another version in uh, English Standard Version. It says, we are God's handiwork or workmanship created in Christ for good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. 
So the first thing that I want you to, you know, be impressed with, as, and you probably already sense it as you read Ephesians 1 and 2, is this key word here, affirm. There are two things that I want to bring across as ideas. One, if you look closely at the passage, especially the first four chapters, you, you, it is quite clear that God wants you to know that you are His idea. You are God's idea. Uh, most of you here are creatives or leaders. Uh, leaders are creatives too. Uh, you, have you ever worked on you know, some uh, beautiful code or wonderful composition or some exquisite writing, maybe a unique design, and some that's very original, and, or maybe you cooked a delicious meal for someone you love, something that you created yourself, right? It, this becomes that like you have great ownership over it. And when somebody makes a critique on it, it's really hard, isn't it? Right? But that is kind of like your masterpiece. That is your handiwork. In, in the same way, God lovingly handcrafted you. He wrote your unique story. We, I'm always reminded that God is not just the creator of our lives, but He's also the author of our stories. You belong to Him. If you just pause and think about that, you belong to the God of this universe. So you are God's idea. But the second thought that it's, you know, we always say that, but, you know, it's, it's just, import, just as important is that you are a good idea. You're not just God's idea, but you are go a good idea. Out of the seven billion people in this world, there's only one you. The enemy would have you believe that you are an accident. Right? You know, you, you are not good, good looking enough, you're, you don't have enough hair, or you, your clothes don't look as nice as Mark Reddy's, you know, or, or something like that, or whatever. But, and that only makes us live a life that's discontented and dissatisfied. And we, worse still, we, we might end up hating ourselves or comparing with others. But we know those are lies. Those are the lies of the enemy. And we need to reject that. You are God's idea. You're a good idea. I know many of you just met yesterday and just getting to know one another, but I want you to do something, okay? Turn to somebody next to you and I want you to look them in the eye, okay? By faith, okay? If you don't quite believe it yet, by faith, say, you are God's idea, okay? And you are a good idea. Come on, let's do that. You got to face them, all right? Eye to eye. You can say it in Chinese if you want. Okay, now turn to the other person. <laughs> okay, let me have a show of hands. How many believe your neighbor? How many really believe your neighbor? Oh, oh, not, oh okay. <laughs> if you don't believe, at least believe the God of this universe who speaks to you. He says to you, you are mine. You belong to me. You are my idea. When you continue to study Ephesians, you will see this reality, this, this radical truth that, that just jumps up at you. So what? So what? So what if we're God's idea or if we're a good idea? If you really grasp this idea, it will re radically change the posture of your life and ministry. I guarantee you that. When you affirm the truth on this solid foundation that you are God's idea and you are a good idea, with the humble heart, you would be able to step forth, you know, step boldly into the destiny God has for you. So the first thing I want you to remember, be affirm. Be affirm of your identity in Him. The second thing is, no doubt, when you took time to worship God through those scriptures earlier, you were amazed. You, you, you were, it just came at you to say, my gosh, this is the kind of God that came, redeemed us, loved us. And, you know, of course, we've already read most of the passages, but, you know, there's so many things that are said about you or about what God did that's just truly amazing. Uh, and, and, you know, we already won't, won't take much time here, but you, you, it just, 
it helps us to just stop and marvel at what Jesus, uh, who He is, what He's done. I think Ephesians 2, 9 sums it well, for me at least, you know. It says, it is not of ourselves. It is a gift of God. Remember, none of these things, you could have earned it. None of us in this room can say we merited this or we can earn it. So what does that mean? It actually means that it's already done. It's already yours. Contrast this to the world that tells you you got to earn it. You got to make it. You got to, you know, prove yourself. Jesus says to us, it's done. And when we truly grasp this, the effect is rest. Right? We rest. Spiritual rest, you know. So if you don't mind, I just want you to pause for a moment. You don't turn to anybody. Just on your own, you want to close your eyes, you can. Just stop and reflect just for a minute. Why are you doing what you're doing? What's driving you? Is it because you're affirmed and amazed about what God has done? Just take a moment to do that. When we begin to lead and live from that different place, I really believe that this is what will happen. And this is something that I I, I think would characterize all of our lives. We will live and lead with nothing to prove, nothing to lose, and nothing to hide. And let me explain it briefly. Nothing to prove in your life but the grace of God. And so we stop striving, striving for, to be loved or accepted. Nothing to lose because we have everything to gain. He's already paid the price. He gave all. And we stop holding back for the fear of rejection or disapproval. And nothing to hide, but we, instead we move intentionally into the authentic and biblical community that God has meant for us to live in. So I want to encourage us, what does that mean to rest in that glorious grace as we join Him in the work that He calls us to, that He has uniquely prepared for each and every one of us here to be part of. Well, moving on. In Ephesians 3, verse 7 and 8, and if you want, you can turn to it, but Paul basically says here that I became a servant of the gospel a servant of the gospel by the gift of God's grace. You see, Paul can write that because he's already got over the first two A's. He knows he's affirmed in that relationship and he he, he continues to stand in amazement of all that God has done. And all that's left, you know, it's for him to take the next two steps. And the next two steps, and uh, as I look at the scripture, I think it's summed up this way. The first is we need to Advance. Well, I've been, my, I remember my church pastor said that, you know, one of the mistakes, b- biggest mistakes we make as a church is that we've, we th- think we are still in peacetime or we, we act like we are still in peacetime. I've been to the military, so I know what it's like when you are exercising and you are holding up a gun, but all you shoot is bang, 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 bang. Literally, because, you know, we want to save the ammunition. So we don't use the real thing, but and we can't use the real thing because we could shoot somebody. So we go bang, bang, bang. So if you go bang, 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 there's nothing flying out of that M16 rifle. Do you think your friends or the people in, your, in the opposing side is going to be afraid of you? Or are you taking it seriously at all if you think it's peacetime? So one of the greatest mistakes we make you know, as a church sometimes is that we think we're still in peacetime, but actually we are at war and we should be advancing. So not, not a whole lot to say about that. You know it you, in your own life, the spiritual battles that we fight as well and the reality that, the, of the unseen world. But as we advance, what are we called to do? As Paul says, he's become the servant of the gospel. It is to announce. 
It is to declare His gift of grace in His life and in our case, our lives. And as you've read, to tell of the mystery. You are the servant of the gospel. And by the way, He's qualified you. You don't have to go to seminary. You don't have to be, have a degree in whatever, you know. Those things can equip us, but He's already qualified you. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 5 and 6. And entrusted you, by the way, to proclaim this gift of grace. So He's made us competent. That's the major theme of Ephesians. God's grace and riches, and then proclaiming the mystery. So, I'm going to do a quick review here, but I want you to take note of this. You know, that this is a very important principle and perspective that God's work in us must precede God's work through us. You know, and I'll explain this to you with this, okay? I hope this works. So I stand as a child of God, right? You've read Ephesians. We know He suffered my identity in Him. What an amazing God we serve. What does that do for us as we move? This now becomes, if if this were a war, like a shield I would hold, right? Against the enemy. The attacks, the assaults, and the accusations that will for sure come. Have you experienced that? Hands up if anybody has experienced that. Oh, is it only me? Okay. (laughs) Right? We experience that. But if if this is, is anchored, we face this. But at the same time, we know we advance. The victory is already His. There's no doubt about that. But we announce to the world, and this illustration was, isn't too good. I wish you grab a whole bunch of you here. We stand together in that whole process. I'm not alone. And that's why we need this body. That's why we need indigenous in a sense, because that movement who is passionate about Christ, we would advance against the assaults of the enemy. God's work in us must precede uh, God's work through us. And I'll end with this story about my three kids. Um, I know that most of you, when they look at me, think that I'm 28 years old (laughs) and that I'm married at uh, three years old. (laughs) No. But I have three kids. Uh, This is an old picture. Uh, My oldest son is 14 now, and the youngest is nine. But I I love to do fun things with them. And one of the things that I do is I take them on a car wash. And we still do that, but now, you know, we just kind of spray. But in Singapore, we we carry the pail and we would fill up with water. And it's so fun. But there was this particular time that I did the car wash with them that I can never forget. And I know some of you in this room have heard me tell this story before. Uh, But... My youngest one, I still remember, Zachary, he, he, the pail was still half full and he just kind of smiled at me and he took the pail and just kind of lifted it over his head and got all soaked. And, and I was trying in the meantime to wash the car. Okay, so before I tell you what I learned as I walked off, I, let me ask you this question. Did the car get washed in the end? Oh, did the car get washed? Yes? No? Yes? Okay, it got washed in the end, right? Okay, let me ask you, who washed the car? (laughs) Come on, louder, you can do it. Who washed the car? (laughs) I washed the car. What do you think they did? They played. Of course, you might say, you are a silly dad to bring three young kids to go wash the car, of course, right? But as I walked off that day, the Lord impressed upon me two very important things. One, is that He gave me a picture that He delights in me as His child. Remember, we bring Him pleasure. And I did enjoy the kids. I mean, even when Zach did that thing over his head, it was was like, oh, but it's funny. And I, I, you know, it's a beautiful memory. God delights in me. And the second truth, he, He brought it so clear to me was that He wants me to join Him in the task. My little kids were thinking as they were washing or soaping, they say, hey, I'm helping daddy wash the car. Look at me. But actually, you said it right. I got it done. And that day, as I walked off, just from a car wash, the Lord impressed upon me, even with ministry burdens on my shoulders at that time. He said, I will get it done. 
So this one phrase that I think helps me stay rested, and for you, I hope, as you move in whatever arena that God might call you to, Daddy gets it done. Your heavenly Daddy, your heavenly Father will get it done. Yes, sure, He delights in us and He wants us to join Him and we should join Him. And He has a specially planned for us, but we need to rest in the fact that He gets it done. Will you join me in prayer? Father, we come humbly before You, resting in that glorious grace that You helped us see this morning from Your Word. And we join You in Your work, offering back to You our unique self, the story that you've written in each of our lives, and yet pressing into the work that you prepared for us and you've called us to do. We thank you. Thank you that you would allow us, Lord, to even play a part. And often we just make more messes than help. But God, you still smile. You still have, find pleasure in us and you still call us to join you. And that's the kind of God you are. I pray that as we go through this day, you help us to keep that in mind, that God, you will get it done. In your precious name we pray. Amen.